off without any. That's all I can say is the president has a real good selection. <laughs> I'm going to have to run off and leave him again <laughs> if I come back. <laughs> <laughs> and Sank has a good selection, too. <laughs> oh, I'm a forgetful person. <laughs> yep. <No. laughs> the remaining time I'd like to spend, do we have till, what, 4.30 present? 4.45. Okay, well, it, you know, you can not remind me of that. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to discuss the idea of Zion through the ages with you. We've talked about the antediluvian period. We've talked about uh, the uh, <clears throat> Zion back in that time, the Holy Order. But there's some things that we need to say about the Zion idea after the flood and on down through time for a while, and in some measure correlated with our time. Now, Noah is a second Adam in the sense that uh, he's uh, the father of all living on the earth in his day, and uh, he's also in the order of priesthood descending downward, and let me qualify that. He's the second in authority to Adam. To Noah, who is Gabriel, Joseph says, he stands next in authority to Adam in the priesthood. He was called of God to his off to this office and was the You mean I didn't get that good stuff on him? I'm going to have to talk about my tie again. <laughs> okay, for the sake of the record, I'm going to start over without the joyous comment about the ties and without Sanks <clears throat> ratting on me. <laughs> All right, our topic then is Zion through the ages. And we're going to talk about Zion, particularly from the time of the flood on down. And we've said then that, uh, as Joseph said, that Noah is Gabriel, and that he stands next in authority to Adam in the priesthood. And uh, he was called of God to this office, who was the father of all living in his day. And to him was given the dominion. These men held keys first on earth and then in heaven. Some interesting things about Noah in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 27 is a revelation dealing with the sacrament. The first few verses have something to say about the use of the emblems. And then from verse 5 on, it talks about a great sacrament meeting to be held when Christ will partake of the fruit of the vine again with his people and his priesthood authorities on earth. And he indicates then those who will be there. He'll partake of the fruit of the vine with Moroni, verse 5, whom I have sent unto you to reveal the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> containing the fullness of my everlasting gospel, whom I have committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. And also with Elias, to whom I have committed the keys of bringing to pass the restoration of all things, spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began concerning the last days. And he goes down, and I'll read on before I come back to that Elias uh, reference. Verse 7, And also to John, the son of Zechariah, which Zechariah, he, Elias, the Elias of verse 6, visited and gave promise that he should have a son, and his name should be John, and he should be filled with the spirit of Elias. And we said the other day that there are two kinds of Elias. There's the John the Baptist kind, who presides over the spirit of Elias, as, as Revelation decays. And the spirit of Elias, in this sense, is the spirit of the preparatory gospel. 
is the spirit of preparation for a greater revelation from God. And this then was the commission. Now, the one who gave this commission was Elias, a different kind of Elias. And this Elias is the person, the angel, who visited Zacharias and told him he would have a son. And who was this? This was Gabriel. It's Noah. Who then is Noah? Noah is the great Elias of the earth this side of the flood. Is that what it's saying? That's what it's saying. Do you see that? And he appeared then and gave direction concerning matters in the birth of John the Baptist and indicated that John would go forth in the spirit of Elias to bring people into the holy order, to turn the hearts of the fathers, children, fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the ways of the just, and so forth. He would do that. See, this is a family program. And Noah, then, is the, the great Elias uh, of this time. Now, Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And uh, the priesthood then came primarily down through Shem. He's referred to as the great high priest. If you uh, read, for example, section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 41, where President Joseph S. Smith, in his vision of the redemption of the dead, talks about those who were in the spirit world when Christ visited there, he identifies that uh, among those who were there was Shem, he says, the great high priest. Now, Shem is identified as the great high priest. Now, we have the problem along with that <coughs> of uh, Melchizedek, the identity of Melchizedek. And uh, it's interesting, for example, President John Taylor, and this is in this little book, Lectures on Faith, and the, a supplementary thing in the back, he's quoting from the Times, it was printed in the Times and Seasons, volume 5, page 746, and I've uh, gone to that thing, checked the thing out, it's there as it is here. He refers, for example, President John Taylor, he was the editor of the Times and Seasons at the time, First, to the superior knowledge of men like Noah, Shem, he says, who was Melchizedek, and Abraham, the father of the faithful. Then he goes on and talks about they holding the keys of the highest order of the priesthood. This is the holy order. You see that? Now, it's interesting that uh, there's a tradition among the Jews that Shem is Melchizedek. And it raises a question. It raises a question, and uh, one day I got fiddling around uh, in the scriptures, had a little time in the temple between sessions, and, and so I got a set of the scriptures and pulled out my notebook and started figuring things through. Let me give you some interesting facts on this thing. <clears throat> This tradition, the Hebrew tradition, if you want that, holds that Melchizedek was survivor of the flood, was the patriarch Shem. This is the New Smith Dictionary in 1966 under Melchizedek, if you want that. But <clears throat> evidence supports the view that Shem was Melchizedek. This evidence is found in the chronology giving the data on the descent of uh, the patriarchs from Noah to the time of Abraham and after. Consistently, President Joseph S. Smith calls Shem the great high priest in his vision of Christ's ministry of the spirit world. <clears throat> so, too, is Melchizedek, the, the priest of the Most High God, who blessed Abraham and to whom Abraham paid tithes. They both lived and performed their ministry, if they're two separate personages, as pre the presiding high priest of the day. 
Uh, they lived in the same period. <clears throat> this is a clear inference that you might have that the two are one. Melchizedek and other. Now let me let me give you this these facts. This is out of you can pick it out in the Bible, and I just want to follow down through many generations between Noah and Abraham. And you say, wow, ten generations or so, uh, is Shem going to still be around? Well, let's follow through the chronology. Shem was 98 years old at the time of the flood, and his lifespan on earth continued for another 502 years after the flood. That's longer than I would have. Okay? This fact makes the following chronological data important. Shem begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. That's the next patriarch in descent, blood descent, between Shem and Abraham. Two years after the flood. And other sons and daughters. Arphaxad begat Selah. 37 years after the flood. Selah begat Eber, and that's where you get the word Hebrew. Get the word, he begat Eber 67 years after the flood. Now, these people lived a long, longer time, but we're talking about the birth then of one generation to another. So, Eber begat Peleg 101 years after the flood. Peleg begat Ru. 131 years after the flood. Ru begat Sered 163 years <clears throat> after the flood. Sered begat Nahor 195 years, 93 years after the flood. Nahor begat Terah 222 years after the flood. Terah begat Abraham <clears throat> For, uh, 292 years after the flood. Abraham begat Isaac 392 years after the flood. And Isaac begat Jacob 452 years after the flood. Abraham lived 175 years, which means that Abraham, that Shem's lifespan on earth of 502 years after the flood continued for 35 years after Abraham's death. Shem is the great high priest. Noah, and, and he even lived, uh, uh, Shem lived not only after Abraham, but after Isaac and after Jacob. <clears throat> you see that? He was still alive. Jacob was around. All right, uh, <clears throat> Noah is the great high priest who stands next in authority to Adam in the holy priesthood. And Noah's son Shem stands next to Noah in the order of the priesthood since the flood. There is simply no place for another personality like Melchizedek, who was a great high priest in the same order as the Son of God and a type of Christ. There's no other place, no room for him to figure in the same period when Shem lived. The two men had to be the same person, or Shem's name was changed to Melchizedek. Well, think about that. I'm not going to go out and preach it and say, hey, uh, but think about that, see. You do have John Taylor saying Shem is Melchizedek. And you do have the tradition, the Hebrew tradition, saying that that was the case, see. Uh, <clears throat> Leaving that point, let's talk about uh, Abraham and Melchizedek. There's an interesting statement in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. It's uh, in page 322 and 323. Uh, three. And it's a discourse by the, the prophet Joseph Smith on Hebrews chapter 7. Having, he, he starts out by reading the whole, the whole, this, the whole chapter. And then he points out <clears throat> that there are three orders of the priesthood. 
referred to there. Now, he's not talking about the ecclesiastical order in the church. He's talking rather instead about the order of priesthood in the holy order. He's talking in that sense, see. He's talking temple. He's talking Zion and not the ecclesiastical order in, uh, of, of the church of apostles and prophets and evangelists and, he's in, and then the Aaronic priesthood down there where they, where they are. He says the first then of these is the king of Salem. He had power, authority over that of Abraham, holding the key and the power of endless life. Angels desired to look into it, but they have set up too many stakes. God cursed the children of Israel just because they would not receive the last law from Moses. And then he goes on. Now he's talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek. And as the prophet, let me just uh, make a clarification or two, as the prophet deals with it here, the priesthood of Melchizedek is the fullness of the priesthood. It's the fullness of the priesthood. It's the temple priesthood. It's the order of kings and priests. This is what Melchizedek had. Now he says, The sacrifice required of Abraham in the offering up of his, of his son Isaac shows that if a man would attain to the keys of the kingdom of an endless life, he must sacrifice all things. Now what does that say for Abraham? Abraham received priesthood, and he got it initially from, from Melchizedek. And what he got was a lesser order of priesthood, which Joseph Smith calls the patriarchal priesthood. And he says, go to and finish the temple of God, and God will fill it with power, and you'll then receive more knowledge concerning this priesthood. Now, the patriarchal priesthood is that which is given when we are given the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we become fathers and mothers spiritually under Christ within the holy order by and through the sacred covenant of temple marriage, see? And that's patriarchal, but there's a higher order than that. That's what he's getting to, see? There's a higher order than that. Now he says, what is the power of Melchizedek? Twas not the priesthood of Aaron, which administers in outward ordinances, and offerings of sacrifice. Those holding the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood are kings and priests of the Most High God, holding the keys of power and blessings. In fact, this priesthood is a perfect law of theocracy and stands as God to give laws to the people, administering endless lives to the sons and daughters of Adam. Now, he's not talking of any office in the church. He's talking of the fullness of the priesthood in the house of the Lord. And uh, he goes on in his discourse, Melchizedek priesthood holds the right from the eternal God, and not by descent from father and mother. He says, uh, third priesthood then is Levitical priesthood. It consists of priests uh, uh, to administer in outward ordinances, made without an oath. But the priesthood of Melchizedek is by an oath and a covenant. Now, I don't know that I dare say this. Maybe I can say it, though, in the right way. Ordination to the office of elder gives you the Melchizedek priesthood. And it introduces you into the order of the priesthood that finally leads on upward uh, to become kings and priests in the house of the Lord. Ordination to the office of elder doesn't make you a king and a priest. It doesn't. Neither does ordination to the office of elder give to you the full covenant of the Melchizedek priesthood. If you read section 84 carefully, you find that that's the case. It starts out with the building of Mount Zion as a cloud by with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It goes on and talks about becoming sons of Moses and of Aaron, and being sanctified by the Spirit and the renewing of your bodies. And he says, And also all they that received this priesthood 
Receive me, saith the Lord, for he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my Father. And he that receiveth my Father receiveth my Father's kingdom, therefore all that my Father hath shall be given unto him. And this is according to the oath and covenant which belongs to the priesthood. Therefore, all those who receive this priesthood receive this oath and covenant of my Father, which he cannot break, neither can it be moved. But whoso breaketh this covenant which he hath received, after he hath received it, and altogether turned it therefrom, shall not have forgiveness of sins in this world or in the world to come. Now, you become perdition if you break that. One contribution that's made in the inspired revision, and this is Genesis chapter 14, is to give us an account of the fullness of priesthood and the oath and covenant related to it. Here in chapter 14, for example, it talks about Melchizedek. Verse uh, 25. Now Melchizedek was a man of faith, verse 26, who wrought righteousness and when a child, he feared God and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the violence of fire. And thus, having been approved of God, he was ordained an high priest after the order of the covenant which God made with Enoch. And that's not a high priest like we are a high priest. That's a high priest in the holy order, see? It being after the order of the Son of God, which order came not by man nor by the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of God. And it was delivered unto man by the calling of his own voice. It just isn't given by your bishop and your state president. It's given by the calling of his own voice, according to his own will, unto as many as believed on his name. For God, having forsworn, or sworn with e unto Enoch, and unto his seed with an oath, and this is the oath now of the Melchizedek priesthood. And the setting now is fullness of priesthood. The setting is full. This is the oath, and this is the covenant. For God having sworn unto Enoch by an oath by himself, that everyone being ordained after this order, and the antecedent to this is this order then which, which, uh, uh, Enoch and Melchizedek received. It's after the order of the Son of God, and which is based on the fullness of the priesthood, okay? For God having sworn to Enoch and to receive that every, with an oath by himself that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, <clears throat> to divide the seas, to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of God, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and this by the will of the Son, which was from before the foundations of the world. And all men having this faith, coming up to this order of God, were translated and taken up into heaven. See, you have to have fullness of priesthood before you get into the realm of time. All right, and now Melchizedek was a priest of this order, and therefore he obtained peace in Salem and was called the Prince of Peace. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven. They got the blessings of the second comforter and sought for the city of Enoch, which God had before taken. And they not only sought, but they found, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days or the end of the world. And hath said and sworn with an oath that the heavens and the earth should come together and the sons of God should be tried so as by fire. And this Melchizedek, having thus established righteousness, was called the king of heaven by his people, or in other words, the king of peace. And he lifted up his voice and he blessed Abram, being the high priest and the keeper of the storehouse of God, him whom God had appeared appointed to receive tithes for the poor. Wherefore Abraham paid unto him tithes of all that he had, of all the riches which he possessed, which God had given unto him. 
And it came to pass that God blessed Abram and gave unto him riches and honor and so forth. See. Now that's the oath and the covenant. In section 84, those who receive this receive all that the Father has. That's heirship. That requires consecration. That requires the order of the temple. You can't get the oath and covenant merely by ordination to the Melchizedek priesthood. You've got to come into that order and that program by which you finally come up and inherit all things. And then when you get to that level, God makes issues or utters a sacred oath to you and administers a sacred covenant. And that covenant then has three basic divisions. One, the promise of Christ and the redemptive power of Christ. Two, the covenant that through Christ God would write his law on your heart, transform and change you, make you a true, a, a new creature in Christ. And number three, that having brought you up to the standard of the fullness of his priesthood, he will then give you power over the elements to break boundaries, to divide the sea, and to break the powers of heaven above, to stand in the presence of God, to walk and to talk and to commune openly and directly with God. See? Now that's the oath and the covenant of the Melchizedek priesthood. And that's the thing then that the prophet Joseph Smith uh, was talking about. That's the, that's the order of things that the prophet was talking about. Now, when we see that program, then we see, for instance, that this is the goal, and this was the order of things that prevailed in the period after the flood. Now, as you, as you deal with the history of the period after the flood, then you come from Noah and through Shem, you finally get down to Abraham, and he gets these blessings, and he got them on a two-stage level. He first got the, the patriarchal priesthood, and then in order to get the keys, not just the fullness of the priesthood, but the keys, the Lord required of him that great and supreme sacrifice, the requirement to sacrifice all things. And that's not only a requirement on his part, but it's a, it is an example to all of us. The Lord doesn't require each person to give his firstborn, but every person who would come to the standard of the fullness the Lord requires to give his all and to sacrifice on the altar his dignity, his good name, and anything that he has, and particularly that which is most sacred to him. The thing that was most sacred to Abraham was his son, not because he waited a long time to get him, not because he went through the trauma of, of having received him as uh, Sarah was over nine years of age and all of that. All of that was important. But the thing that really made it important was that he knew the holy order, and he knew that these rites descended through in the flesh. And he wrestled with that one as to who his heir was going to be. And he finally got an heir. His name was Isaac. And then the Lord required him to put that boy on the altar and give him back. Not just to give the boy back. He was an older man by the time. With this idea of putting a six-year-old kid on the altar and everything. He was older than that. But to also put on the altar all of the promises that God had made to him concerning his posterity. That's what he required. And those are the things to Abraham, conditioned, filled with the Spirit, filled with the knowledge of Christ King as he was. Those are the things then that were required of him, and he had to sacrifice all things. Now until a person is ready to meet that kind of sin and sacrifice all things, he cannot attain to lasting life. I get full as a priesthood, but he may not understanding, feeling that that would under his needs. Joseph the prophet made that sacrifice. 
others who have made that sacrifice. There are those living today who have made that sacrifice. And uh, it's done quietly at times. You don't broadcast and say, we look at it, put it in the spotlight. Here's one now who's getting into that realm of, of life experience. But nevertheless, that's the requirement. Now, <clears throat> Abraham then, first of all, received the patriarchal priesthood. And then, by his diligence and his quest, then, he sought for, as he says in chapter 1 of the book of Abraham, I sought for the rights of the priesthood according to the fathers and the right to ordain and preside over and administer the same. That's what he sought for. And in order to get it, he had to sacrifice all things. And then when he did, he came up to the statue of Melchizedek. You see that? And that program then, a fullness of priesthood <clears throat> in the holy order, went from Noah then to Shem or Melchizedek, whichever you want to use there, leave that to you, and then to Abraham. And in Israel, it went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph, and we don't have official record on or clear inference of, but possibly to Ephraim. And uh, after that, we don't know quite where it is, except that we know that it was lost. It was lost in ancient Israel. And uh, they didn't have it. They had the tradition, but they didn't have the power. Now, then there came along this person called Moses, born and laid in the bulrushes, raised a prince in Egypt stood in defense when he finally learned who he was of his Israelite brethren, and they turned on him for his officiousness, as they thought, in standing with them and helping them. And so he fled. He fled into the wilderness, and he ends up then being associated with a person called Jethro. And he gets the priesthood from Jethro. Now, what priesthood did he get? Well, let me turn to the teachings, Sponge 180 and 81. We're talking about the priesthood that Moses had. He says, all priesthood is Melchizedek, but there are different portions or degrees of it. That portion which brought Moses to speak with God face to face was taken away with Moses. But that which brought the ministry of angels remained. All the prophets of the Old Testament had the Melchizedek priests and were ordained by God himself. Now we know that somehow the fullness of priesthood continued in Israel for a time after they got it till Elijah. And Elijah is the last great prophet who holds the fullness of the priesthood. But the question is then, how did it get reintroduced <clears throat> into Israel? And the answer is that when Moses fled from Egypt and went into the wilderness, he became identified with Jethro, and Jethro held the fullness of the holy priesthood. And he belonged to a line of men of that caliber. Now, let me read it from the scriptures. This is section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And in verse 6 of the section, it makes reference to the sons of Moses according to the holy priesthood. Now, we've said that there are filial or family relationships in regard to the gospel and being born again and in gospel power. And this is true in priesthood power. And this revelation now is talking about the sons of Moses according to the priesthood, his sons in priesthood, priesthood sons. And it explains later, whoso is faithful to became these two priesthoods of Moses and Aaron, who are sanctified by the Spirit and the renewing of their bodies, and they become the sons of Moses and of Aaron. See, it's talking about that. That's the theme of the revelation. But then it gives us the descent of the priesthood. He says, and Jethro received, well, Moses received it 
under the hand of his father-in-law Jethro. And Jethro received it under the hand of Caleb. And Caleb received it under the hands of Elihu. Now, all of these men held the fullness of priesthood, and they're not in the Abrahamic line. You see that? They're not in the Abrahamic line. And Elihu under the hands of Jeremy, and Jeremy under the hands of Gad, and Gad under the hands of Isaiah. And Isaiah received it under the hands of God. He got it directly from the Lord. And Isaiah also lived in the days of Abraham. And that's interesting. Now, Melchizedek was around, and Abraham's around. He's got Romans of priesthood. And Isaiah lives in the days of Abraham and was apparently subordinate to him in priesthood because it says that he lived in the days of Abraham and was blessed by Abraham, which Abraham received the priesthood from Melchizedek, who received it from the lineage of his fathers, even till Noah. And that word till kind of agitates people. You say uh, there's generations between Noah and Melchizedek. So Shem can't be Melchizedek. That's the argument that sometimes is made. But if you analyze that word till grammatically, you get yourself a good dictionary, a real good one. You analyze that. And you find then that it conveys the idea of from Adam down, not just back, till goes both ways. Till doesn't just go one way. That's the point. You see that? And so the obstacle that some people throw into the path then uh, doesn't fall. It says, from Noah till Enoch, through the lineage of his fathers, and Enoch till Abel. And that's interesting. Abel, not said. Enoch to Abel, who was slain by the conspiracy of his brother, who received the priesthood by the commandment of God, by the hand of his father Adam, who was the first man, which priesthood continued so forth in the church, in the holiest order of God. Now, can you see that picture? Now, under, Mo, under Noah, then, what kind of a program do you have? You have one coming down, then, uh, through Melchizedek to Abraham, and then from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and on into Israel, Joseph, and finally, then, we lose track of it, and it's lost. And Israel doesn't have it any longer, see? But meantime, there's another line of the Holy Order, and we as Latter-day Saints haven't paid as much attention to that one as we ought. We don't read that section of the Doctrine of Covenants with enough clarity and with enough insight and give it enough attention. But there's another line of the Holy Order, and these men held fullness of priesthood, and they built Zion. They were Zion men. Can I put it that way? There was different orders of Zion. Enoch did it, and Melchizedek did it, and all of these did it. And Abraham sought for it and became a great missionary, went to Egypt, sat on the Pharaoh's throne and taught there. And through him, then, many of the things that the Egyptians, early Egyptians had, came into Egypt through Abraham. One day we'll recognize that historically, kind of get these things connected up like they ought to be, you see. But you have that line then coming down into Abraham, but then the other line. And when you come to Moses, then Moses gets it from Jethro, and Moses then brings it into Israel. And it was Moses' intent and desire then to, to develop that program in Israel. That was the order of things that he wanted to develop. See, it wasn't just to give them the gospel, it was to give them the holy order. The record, for example, goes on to say here in section 84, it says, This greater priesthood administer the gospel and holdeth the key to the mysteries of the kingdom, even the key to the knowledge of God. And by the way, that's revelatorily, not just theological knowledge. He says, Therefore, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. And without the ordinances thereof, the authority of the priesthood, the power of God, is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Now, this Moses plainly taught the children of Israel in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify his people that they might behold the face of God. He wanted to bring them into the presence of God. He wanted them to get the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night out from 
in front and behind the camp of Israel and bring it into camp and have the people enjoy it and sanctify them to the extent that they should and could enjoy that. Over here in section 19 of the book of Exodus, you have uh, an interesting account. It's what I call the first great fireside. It's where the Lord instructed Moses to bring Israel to Mount Sinai and let him talk to them. And uh, he gives the instructions in the early part of the chapter as to what was necessary to sanctify and cleanse the people. And then in verse 16 it says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount, and the Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended, that's the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Mm. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Now the children of Israel backed off from that one. Mm. They wouldn't accept the program of personal discipline, of faith, of sanctification, by which they could get those endowments. And so it says that Moses, back to section 84, verse 23, Moses plainly taught this to the children of Israel. He taught it with visual aids, too. And it was a real visual one. It was a real practical one. It wasn't just theology. See, prior... Prior to Moses going to Egypt, like we pointed out the other day, the great experience that he had, as recorded in Moses chapter 1, was given to him. That experience of Moses 1 was not a Mount Sinai experience, in the sense that he was there with Israel and something that he got as a side issue. Rather, instead, that experience was given to him after the burning bush and before he went into Egypt. And it was given to him evidencing that he had spiritually come up to the stature of the blessings of the second comforter. He had got to the top of the mountain, as it were, and could see and knew how he got there. And then he went into Israel, into Egypt, and his eye desire was, and he knew the plan, he knew the order of the kingdom. And his desire now was to take those Israelites who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but who had been in bondage and to bring them out from civilization. And this the Lord did with power, and with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, leading them out and going before them. And they crossed the Red Sea, and when they got on the other side, they had a baptismal ceremony, and they were baptized, and they were given the Holy Ghost and his blessings. Now that's all in the Bible, Corinthians. So they were given those blessings, and Prophet Joseph comments on that from time to time, too. All right, so they were given those, those blessings, and then Moses wanted to take them to Mount Sinai, and he wanted to give them that order of the priesthood by which they could come into the presence of God, so that the cloud by day, which was visibly made manifest, could actually be there, and they could enjoy those blessings and those endowments, and be like the people of Enoch, and have the glory of the Lord there, and the Lord himself personally in their midst. That's what he wanted. You see that? And so he sought to sanctify his people, that they might behold the face of God, as the Doctrine of the Covenant says. But they hardened their hearts, and could not endure his presence. Therefore, the Lord in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they should not enter into his rest, while in the wilderness which rests is the fullness of his glory. Therefore he took Moses out of their midst, and the holy priesthood also. If that full was out, and they didn't have it. Now when they got it back so that Elijah had it, we don't have full record, see. But they didn't have the fullness of the priesthood after that, see. But the idea was that they were to come into God's presence. When you talk about the Mount Sinai thing, just don't say that he offered in the gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, the Holy Ghost, and they rejected that, so he gave them the law of carnal commandments. Don't do it that way. Put it on that higher plane, that higher plane that, that the facts of the situation require. 
Here, for example, in section, in chapter 34 of uh, the book of Genesis, Exodus, pardon me, no wonder, I knew it's 34, of the book of Exodus, you have the Lord in the inspired revision making some clarifications. I think we read this the other day, but I think we need to get it back into the mill. So the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two other tablets of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon them also the words of the law according as they were written at the first, on the set of tablets that thou breakest. But it shall not be according to the first, for I will take away the priesthood out of their midst. Therefore my holy order... <clears throat> And the ordinances thereof, now this is the temple, the ordinances thereof, i.e. the temple, shall not go before them, for my presence shall not go up in their midst, lest I destroy them. And he said, but I will give unto them the law as at the first, but it shall be after the law of the carnal commandments, for I have sworn in my wrath that they should not enter into my presence, into my rest in the days of their pilgrimage. Now, they couldn't enter into his rest. Now, what does the word rest mean? <clears throat> the Sabbath is a day of rest. And that doesn't mean, i.e., sack out. Now, it may mean relaxation in that sense. But there is both a spiritual and a physical connotation. And the Sabbath is a day of rest follows the spiritual, and that's the way the Lord rested in creation on the seventh day, and that's the way the millennium will be a day of rest, and that's the way the Sabbath then is to be a day of rest designed to help us come up to that standard. Now note, for example, Moses took, therefore the Lord took Moses out of the midst and the holy priesthood also. But prior to that, he says that he swore that they should not enter into the rest in the wilderness. Which rest is the fullness of my glory? That's what the rest of the Lord is. It's to be endowed with the powers of the Spirit. Does that bring any peace to you? It should do. I served as a bishop on a BYU campus. And you meet the challenges of young people, and there were times when I would just literally come home nauseated and like to go out in the backyard and throw up. Because of the situation and the way kids get their lives out of order and harmony. And yet with that mantle, starting out early in the morning and getting home at 10, 11 at night, with that mantle, it was a beautiful experience. It was, a, it was a restful one, because I had the Spirit. I had the endowment. It was a day of rest. You see that? Now, what should or what you should, should you not do on the Sabbath? You should do those things that will make it a day of rest, positive rest. Do those things that will build and bring the Spirit into your lives. Some of those things are, first of all, Get to your sacrament meeting and renew your covenants. Secondly, take care of your priestly responsibilities. Thirdly, get engaged in the teaching of the gospel, both in regard to the formal program of the church and in regard to your, and your, your lives. Learn the joy of cuddling up Sunday afternoon with the Book of Mormon and finding Christ there. That's a beautiful experience. Relaxing but not in the sense of snoring and slumbering. Relaxing in the sense that you find Christ in the Book of Mormon. Meet with friends in a gospel sense, doing gospel things. Meet with family, make family important, and orient it toward gospel, see? Do these things outwardly. And you can fill your life up to where it's busy, but when you get through with the Sabbath, it will have been a beautiful experience. I grew up in a farming community where people just thought rest means quit plowing on Sunday. 
Don't do that. And yet some of those old farmers, they were just all geared to work, and they were just all devoted to, to getting something done, and they fidgeted all day long, and finally they get the team out and get out on the old plow and plow the furrow, see, and do it on Sunday, because they didn't know what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to just rest, and they said, I don't need to rest, and they get their critters out and, and do their plowing, and their planting, and whatever else, see. Well, make it a day of rest in the positive sense. See, the millennium is going to be the most active period of the world's history. Make it a day of rest like that. You see, that is the day of rest. All right, so, so Moses then uh, taught this program and endeavored to bring it into operation. And uh, he failed. And yet there are evidences now of the holy order found in the Old Testament. I once said that if the Lord would forgive me having read the Old Testament, for having done it, I would never read it again. <laughs> and I've repented of that one. Peter says that all the holy prophets since the world began testified of the dispensation of the fullness of times. The thing I'm interested in now as I about the Old Testament is to find what it says about our day. And it talks about our day and the personalities of our day. It talks about Joseph. It talks about when the Lord is going to hand, set his hand again the second time and identifies the personalities. It speaks to them. It talks about them. Tell them what they're going to do and the Lord's promises in relation to them. It talks about the redemption of Zion. It talks about the great program of the Assyrian of God's kingdom. So if you're interested in the last days, read the Old Testament, <clears throat> and particularly Isaiah. There's a chapter of Isaiah. If you understand it correctly, we'll do something about that tonight. If you understand it correctly, that doesn't apply to the last days. And you have to work at it, and you have to sit down and read it and reread it, and study it over, and then don't worry about too many of the, commentary, the commentaries. They provide some good and helpful things, but I've never seen a book on Isaiah yet that really got to the core. Not one. That doesn't mean you can't study them, they don't have a lot of interesting things, but there is something about Isaiah that is covered, just like Isaiah 6 says. And uh, we just, and, and it's interesting how many people have been interested in this gra gratifying, literally gratifying, to see the interest there. And we're moving and we're doing it. And we're going to finally, I think, come to it, see, but we haven't got there yet, see, so there's still, still room. But there's evidences now of, in, the, in Israel, of the Holy Order. Now, the Holy Order is a family order. The Holy Order centers in the temple. The Holy Order centers in priesthood. The Holy Order centers in the gospel. And it is a uh, order of... Uh, priesthood that descends by lineage through various tribes. Here in the teachings, page 189, the prophet, first of all, reads the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. And then he makes this commentary statement. Now read particularly verse 4. If you understand verse 4, I once made the statement in, in uh, the Doctrine and Covenants class, that if someone could come into my office and explain Romans 9 and 4 in the detail that I knew and understood it could be and ought to be understood, I would simply give them an A and excuse them from all exams. I had a couple of three try it, and I never gave an A on that basis. <clears throat> I never gave an A, but I, I, I got them worked up. <laughs> now he... Uh, spoke of the subject of election, and I want to get to that in a minute now, and read the ninth chapter of Romans, from which it is evident that the election there spoken of, there's more than one kind of election, the election there spoken of was pertaining to the flesh, and had reference to the seed of Abraham, according to the promise God made to Abraham, and then quoting verse 4, in the and so all seed, uh, in thy seed shall all blessings uh, of families of the earth be blessed. Quoting now verse 4, to them belonged the adoption and the covenants, etc. Verse 4 then belongs to them. 
he goes on and says, The election of the promised seed still continues, and in the last days they shall have the priesthood restored to them, and they shall be saviors on Mount Zion, the ministers of God. If it were not so, the remnant which was left, they, if it was not for the remnant which was left, they might even now be a Sodom and Gomorrah. The whole chapter had reference to the priesthood and the house of Israel, an unconditional election of individuals to eternal life was never taught by the apostles. So forth, see. Well, what is the election? Election means to appoint, to call. An elect lady, like Emma Smith was, was one who had an appointment from the Lord to do something, and that appointment was fulfilled. When she, one of them is the appointment of the blessing. The Lord says, for example, I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Now, firstborn in what sense? <clears throat> what does firstborn mean? And what are the rights of the firstborn? Over here in First Chronicles chapter 5, you have... Uh, <clears throat> An interesting statement that reveals some insights into the, the Israel program, if I can get to it. Beginning of verse 1, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his, first, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph the son of Israel, and the genealogy in priesthood is not to be reckoned after him, see. He says, For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. Now what's the birthright? In the context of the holy order, it's the right to the fools of the priesthood. It's the right to be the priest of God, to hold the fullness of priesthood to build the temple of God, to minister the gospel, to minister the family order and the covenants in the house of the Lord, to promulgate the gospel to the earth, and to hold the keys then of redemption and salvation on up through to the capstone of Mount Zion. See, that's what the fullness of the, that's what Ephraim is. He's got that right, that privilege now by blood to that particular right. Now, what did David have? What did Judah have? Judah prevailed above his brethren, of him came the chief ruler. Now, what does the term chief ruler mean? It ought to be capitalized. It's not, but it ought to be. The chief ruler has its center in the temple. In the temple, every righteous man should be brought up to become a king and a priest in the, in, in the holy order. But that doesn't mean, then, that you have a whole batch <clears throat> of political figures running around, each in his own little clan or family. But rather, instead, you do what we do in the Holy Apostleship today. You have every man ordained to the fullness of the apostle, the blessings of the Apostleship, given the full rights to preside over the Church. But they take those rights and they put them in escrow after they have in sacred blessing by the laying on of hands transferred the right to one man to be the chief apostle, to be the chief prophet. So that the rights that they have now to preside over the church are held in abeyance and they're all centered on the one man and he then is the living prophet. He is the chief prophet. He is the chief apostle. Now, in the holy order, you do that same thing politically. Every man is a king, but there is a chief ruler, and that chief ruler program centered in David. David was the chief ruler. Now, he didn't get the fullness of the blessings of the gospel. Here, for example, in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith was speaking of the of uh, David, and he says this in the teachings, page three thirty nine. 
Although David was a king, he never did obtain the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, what are you talking about that in relation to being a king? What's that got to do with being a king? Well, the idea was that it was a king and a priest in the house of the Lord. That's what the idea, and that's the context of what Joseph is saying. You see that? Although David was a king, he never did obtain the spirit and power of Elijah and the fullness of the priesthood. Good thing he didn't with what he did. You see that? He never came up to that full level. He got, he got the order, the, the political order of the holy order, but there was a lesser kind of program. It was adapted down. It was watered down. You see that? And he was anointed by Samuel, and that's, that anointing that Samuel performed was a temple ordinance. I do it every week. It was a temple ordinance applied to Israel to be the chief ruler, though. I don't do that one every week. But it is an ordinance in that sense, see, anointing to become a king and a priest. It was a temple ordinance. And so he says, although he was a king, in that program that he got, he never did obtain the spirit and power of Elijah and the fullness of the priesthood and the priesthood that he received. And the throne and the kingdom of David are to be taken from him and given to another by the name of David in the last days raised up out of his lineage. Now, there's an interesting one, because that brings it down to our time. You see that? All right, but David then was the chief ruler. Judah prevailed, and of him came the right to be the chief ruler in the holy order. Now, that wasn't as important. It was more flowery. It had more splendor to it. It had more uh, public appeal to it. But it wasn't nearly as important, ultimately, <clears throat> as what Levi got. There's three bloodlines now. Ephraim, in point of order of, of importance, Ephraim, Levi, and Judah, centering in the house of David. You see that? Now, what was, what was Levi's? Well, we read of the Levites as, as being the priests back in those days and ministering the law of sacrifice and, and doing those things. You need to broaden the picture in relation to, to Levi. Aaron, for example, who is the head now of the Levitical order of things, Aaron had an interesting role and an interesting relationship with Moses. He was what I call a minor prophet. Now, we, we call minor prophets in the Old Testament those prophets who didn't say very much or of whose writings we don't have very much, see. But a minor prophet is a prophet underneath or beneath the presiding figure. Read Exodus chapter 26, for example, and you have a whole chapter dealing with Aaron and uh, the sacred robes that he was supposed to wear, the ephod of God, and, and in that there was the Urim and the Thummim, and he had a right to the Urim and the Thummim, and he was a judge, and he was a prophet in Israel under Moses with spiritual rights, including the right to the Urim and Thummim. Now, in addition to that, he held the keys, then, of the Aaronic priesthood, the lesser priesthood. And in connection with that, he held the keys of sacrifice. And he held, then, then the, the prophetic role, the Urim and Thummim role, the... Uh, uh, presiding authority over the Aaronic priesthood, which includes the presiding bishopric if it were fully put fully into operation, and then the right to administer the sacred sacrifice as a similitude of Jesus Christ. Now, I submit that that may be more important than sitting on the throne. I believe it is. See? And he has that particular right given to him, and it's one that descends by blood. Here in the teachings, page 318, the prophet quotes several statements that pertain to, to Aaron, and then he adds this. this. These statements indicate this to be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Then the prophet makes his comment. He says, here is a little of law which must be fulfilled. You can see what he's saying? This is an order. It's an everlasting, and that, and that thing is going to be restored and brought forth. And here is a little of law that must be fulfilled. The Levitical priesthood is forever hereditary, he continues, fixed on the head of Aaron and his sons forever. 
and was in active operation down through Zechariah, the father of John, and indicates now that in the latter day, in the restitution of all things, that needs to be fulfilled, see? And that's where section 86 comes into the picture. For example, 86 is a chapter, a revelation on on the... Uh, uh, the, the the wheat and the tares. It's an explanation of the parable of the wheat and the tares. And having explained that, having its setting in Christ and the Apostles' day and its fulfillment in our day, uh, then the Lord adds this, beginning with verse 8. Having explained now the parable of the wheat and the tares and the need then to, first of all, gather out the wheat from among the tares... And after the gathering of wheat, behold, and lo, the tares are bound in bundles, and the field remains to be burned. Now, the gathering of the wheat from among the tares is the gathering of the righteous to Zion, and the full gathering program is that of the 144,000 high priests, and the gathering is to the church of the firstborn. And then, when that is done, then... The tares are bound in bundles, and they are burned at the second coming of Christ. Now, having said all that, then in verse 8 of the, of, the, of the section, he says, therefore, and that word therefore ties in what has been said before with what he's now going to say. <clears throat> therefore, thus saith the Lord, unto you with whom the priesthood hath continued through the lineage of your fathers. Now, he's talking to Joseph and to people in that day, and he's saying that the priesthood had continued from father to son in its rights in the flesh to them. Continued uh, the priesthood then, which hath been is continued then through the lineage of your fathers, he says, For ye are lawful heirs according to the flesh, and have been hid from the world with Christ in God. Can you see what he's saying? People don't know about those three presiding bloodlines. They don't know that the Lord is going to gather Israel, and the gathering of Israel presupposes the establishment of the order of Israel which is the holy order, and gathering of Israel then to, not just physically, but to the house of the Lord, and more specifically, to the holy of holies. And as you gather the twelve tribes to the temple, and give them the full rights of the temple, then you gather all tribes of Israel into the presiding three bloodlines. If they get the fullness of the blessings of the temple, they are kings and priests. That's Ephraim and the rights of Judah. They also get the blessings of the Urim and Thummim. Every person, man who's exalted to a state of exaltation in the celestial king will have a Urim and Thummim. That's Levi. You see that? That's Levi. They're given the sacred covenant of sacrifice. That's Levi. They're given the priesthood after the order of Aaron, not in the ecclesiastical order, in the temple order, but the sacred robes. That's Aaron. You see that? And all Israel then finally are gathered to the three presiding bloodlines and they converge. And they either get those blessings by right of blood or by adoption. And that's what Joseph is talking about. And he says further that the bloodlines to bring this to pass are in the church. Note that. Therefore, thus saith the Lord and you with whom the priesthood hath continued to the lineage of your fathers, for ye are lawful heirs. This priesthood is continued from father to son on down through. Ye are lawful heirs according to the flesh and have been hid from the world with Christ and God. Therefore, your life and the priesthood have remained and must needs remain through you and your lineage until the restoration of all things. I thought Joseph Smith brought the restoration of all things. That's not what this is saying. This says this thing, the rights of the priesthood in relation to these three bloodlines is going to continue on down through, through you and your lineage until finally you finally blossom this whole thing out. You restore the Israel order. 
You gather Israel. You bring them to Mount Zion. You establish Ephraim in his rights. You give fullness of priesthood. You establish Levi in his rights. You bring in that order of society. You establish David, that order of kings, in his full rights and his full privileges. And this, then, is the composite of all this, is the restitution of all things. That's what he's saying, isn't it? And he says, and this is the restitution of all things spoken of by the mouth of holy, all the holy prophets since the world began. Therefore, blessed are ye, if ye continue in my goodness, a light to the Gentiles, and through this priesthood a Savior unto my people, the Lord hath said it. Now, a lot of people think, well, where are the tribes and where are the presiding bloodlines? Well, they're scattered. But uh, let me just suggest you reading, and I'm going to leave this with just this suggestion, that you read Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 does what many Latter-day Saints do with their genealogy. They, they create a tree, and then they <clears throat> say, here's the trunk, and here's a branch, and here's a twig, and this is me, this little leaf over here, see? And they portray it in the form of a tree. Now, Isaiah portrayed the building of the Holy Order in the form of a plant that had a stem, a rod, a root, and a branch. Section 113 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which deals with the same subject, explains that the stem is Jesus, that the rod is a descendant of Jesse, who is the father of David, and of Ephraim. It doesn't identify who that is. <clears throat> and then it goes on and says that in that day, the root of Jesse will stand as an ensign to the Gentiles. And if you study that closely, that root then is a descendant of Ephraim and also of Jesse. If you'll study that very clearly, you'll find that that's the prophet Joseph Smith. doesn't identify the branch. And the rod then is identified merely as it's. But these are the presiding figures then in this program, see, and they center in us and the bloodlines to bring this restitution of all things. These bloodlines are in the church. And we need to note that, see, these blood, and they need to be called out. And we need to think about Zion and build eventually Zion, and when it is built, this is the foundation on which it will be built. Now, we've got 15 minutes to go, and I want to turn to the subject then in light of what we've said of making your calling and your election sure. And see this now, not just as we might normally <laughs> discuss it, but see it in light of what we have said. Now, there are two divisions to the doctrine <clears throat> of election. The basic doctrine of calling and election and the doctrine of making our calling and election sure. Okay? Now, calling election, it means appointments, designations, promises, commitments. And in the context in which we have talked about it, there are three bloodlines who are called and elected to certain privileges. Ephraim to his rights, Levi to his, and uh, the Davidic order to theirs. Okay? There's three. <clears throat> now, it begins in the pre-earth life, when after the Grand Council in heaven, after the announcement of their decisions to the, to the uh, various congregations throughout this eternity, after the war in heaven, and after Lucifer then was cast out. Then the Father began the work of organizing things for the second estate. And as it came to this earth, then at the time of Adam's creation, about that period, Joseph Smith says, this is the teachings, page 158, he says, the Father called all spirits before him at the creation of man and organized them. He, Adam, is the head and was told to multiply. Now, in that organization, then, he said, okay, here's this great Gentile nation, and it's going to inhabit what we now call the land of America. And that's an election. That's an appointment. 
And the Book of Mormon pays quite a bit of respect to that one, does it not? It's a Gentile nation, and the word Gentile means great nation, and it's a noble word. It's a noble word, and it carries with it noble and distinct qualities and connotations. See? Uh, but the real election program in relation to the gospel then centers in Abraham, and it, it branches out then into Ephraim and into Levi and into David. And that program then comes down to the latter day, and as Joseph Smith says, the, the election of Israel still continues. It still continues. It's here. Well, I don't know whether we each know who we are in relation to that, but it's still here. And if we don't know, then maybe we ought to ponder on the subject, see. And that election then is one that was made in the council of heaven, and it's an appointment pertaining to the flesh. And that's the first phase, then, of the doctrine of election. There was, for example, in pre-earth life, a house of Israel in the spirit world. And this is a part of the whole scenario of the first estate. Moses knew all about this and told the Israelites to go home and ponder it. He said, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, going back into pre-earth life. Ask your father, and he will shew thee and thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided the nations to the nations their inheritance, he separated the sons of Adam. He separated the, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. He used them as the basic criterion. You see that? Deuteronomy 32 and 8. <clears throat> okay? Now that's the doctrine of election. And with that then... <clears throat> With that then came certain promises that were given to all Israel. And, and the great chapter on that is, is uh, uh, Romans chapter 9. And Romans 9 then speaks of that. This is the one the prophet read. And verse 4 of Romans 9 is of special importance. Here, for example, Paul writes, speaking of Israelites, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Now, what was given to Israel? If you are born in any of the tribes of Israel, with any blood of Israel in you, you have the right to stand up and claim the adoption. Now, what adoption? The adoption into the family of Jesus Christ. You have a right, if you will apply yourself, to the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. You have a right to the glory. This is part of Israel's right. And this was the whole issue with Elijah when he had his encounter with the priests of Baal. You guys say you're the true spiritual leaders. I am the prophet of Jehovah. Now let's put it to the test. Israel has a right to the glory. Now let's do a practical demonstration on that. Go build yourself an altar. <clears throat> And put yourself a bullock on it and call down the glory of God from heaven to consume it. That was the issue, and that was our practical issue, because the Israelites knew that they had a right to the glory. It was the cloud by day, it was the pillar of fire by night. It was the power that centered in, in the temple of Solomon to the extent that the priest couldn't go in. They had a right to it. They had that privilege. And so the priests of Baal tried it. And they howled and they jumped around, about like a lot of the musical people today do, with about as much zeal and about as much wiggling and twisting, and nothing happened. And Isaiah taunted them, and nothing happened. And then Isaiah, when they got through, put his bullock on the altar, covered it with water, dug a trench around it, filled the thing up, so it was soaked literally. And then he stood back and he talked to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of glory. And he said, okay, I'm your prophet. And now honor that prophetic call. And the glory of God descended and consumed the altar and the planet and the water and the bullock and everything else. Now that's the demonstration. If you're of Israel, you have a right to the glory. You have a right to the cloud by day and the fire by night. This is our right, but we'd better get out of the Gentile mode and get into the Israel mode. And when we do, 
when Zion is sanctified, as Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 4, and Nephi quotes it in 2 Nephi 14, when Zion has been sanctified, the Lord will create upon every dwelling place in Mount Zion and upon all of her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's her right. You see that? Now he goes on and says, for example, not only the right to the glory but to the covenants. Now, uh, the adoption based on covenants, the, in, the introductory covenants of the gospel. The covenants here referred to in the latter instance have to do with the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord, those sacred rites and ordinances that bring you on up through unto the fullness of the priesthood and so forth. And also then it's their right to, be, to give the law. And when that is fulfilled, the law shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And they have the right into the service of God, into the promises in relation to posterity and all those other things that are directly correlated with those central rights, see. Now that, those are the rights, see, and those are the things that were appointed. And the challenge then is to receive those things, and not only to receive them, but so persist in our efforts and in our righteousness that we get a guarantee from the Lord that we will have them not only here on this earth, but we will have them in eternity. And this aspect of the doctrine of election is called making your calling and election sure. Now, you've got to know what your calling and election is to start with and receive it and work at it and then make it sure. And so it's, it's a multi-step program. You see that? Now, one basic thing in this program of making call and election sure is to make your calling and election sure in respect to the basic program of the gospel. And that program is designed to sanctify you, forgive you, sanctify you, and, and bring you back into God's presence. And here in section 68, verse 12, Revelation given in November 31, how as many as the Father shall bear record, to you shall be given power to seal them unto eternal life. One who receives that promise, which can be given outside of the temple, has his or her calling and election made sure to the celestial kingdom as a single individual. Now, you can also receive your calling and election sure in relation to the sacred ordinances of the house of the Lord. If you persist in righteousness, then you make your calling election sure, and that marriage ceremony, which had contingency clauses in it, has those contingency clauses taken out. And you have a guarantee, if it's sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise or the ratifying action of the Holy Ghost, that that covenant will hold in eternity, and you have that election scene. Now, it's on this basis, then, that we understand the term the more sure word of prophecy. In section 131, the prophet refers to this. And let me hurry and quit, and we'll through on it. The more sure word of prophecy. This implies that there is an initial word of prophecy that isn't quite so sure, isn't it? And then that you get something that is sure. Now, when the Father organized all spirits in that great council after the war in heaven, when he did this, then he gave promises to various people as groups. Israel is an elect people. The Gentiles were an elect people. And these promises then were prophetic in their nature. They were something that were, were to come. They were something to come. And so they were prophetic and they were made as a word of prophecy. You see that? And if Joseph Smith, for example, was called to be the head of this dispensation, then that was a prophetic word. And if we were called to become members of Christ's church and receive the gospel, that was a prophetic call relating to our mortality. Now we have to receive that gospel. And then you have to persist in righteousness. And the prophet Joseph Smith said here in the teachings 149 and 50, the, uh, <clears throat> speaking of the second comforter, he says, <clears throat> uh, let that man continue to humble himself before God, 
hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And that gives you the key. And living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say to him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then will man will find his calling and election made sure. You see that? Now, you can make your calling and election sure to be a member of the celestial kingdom. <clears throat> You can make your calling and election sure to be exalted within the celestial kingdom. And Joseph made his calling and election sure to be the head of the dispensation of the fullness of times in eternity. So there are things, various things. It isn't just like an ordinance of baptism. You do. It's applied then to you and to what your election is. And it also has reference to the basic program of the gospel, which is to make sure that you're going to get to the celestial kingdom and to go to the temple and make your calling and election sure there to the marriage relationship. But it also includes other things according to the Lord's appointment. See, my calling and my election is different than yours. Do you know what yours is? I know what mine is, and I'm working on it very humbly, very, very humbly, see. Now, in that sense, then, if Abraham knew who he was, and then he received, and if you're going to move on then and make your calling and election sure, then you've got to know what it is to start with, see. And you've got to work with the Lord and bring your life in harmony so that he can give you those blessings, and he gives them to you line upon line, precept upon precept. He may open things up rather marvelously at times, but, but he gives them to you in that way, see. Now, that's the blessing, see, of the gospel and of, the, of Zion and the order of Zion on down through to our day. And here we are sitting in a Gentile church. And I don't mean to discredit the church, but basically we're oriented to Gentile culture. And we have the great challenge now to move on to Zion. And it's a marvelous one, a blessed one. I just pray, my brothers and sisters, that we can catch that vision and that we can do something intelligently in our lives and with our families and our friends. And I say it humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just take a minute here. <clears throat> Talks about bond and free in the scripture several times. Is this little or figurative? <clears throat> It's both. Bond has reference to one who's under bond or under the bonds of oppression, the free, one who's not. And it applies both ways. What does it mean, the accuser of the brethren? The accuser of the brethren implies that the brethren weren't quite as perfect, maybe, as some people thought they were. We have people today who accuse the brethren, don't you? And the brethren, I've been close enough to them, are great personalities, and they have the endowment of the Spirit, but I don't know that they're absolutely perfect. And if you are looking critically with a jaundiced eye, you might find something, and then you make that an argument against the kingdom, and you accuse the brethren. Now, they did the same kind of thing in the war in heaven, see. Are the ten tribes uh, being, learning or being taught by a prophet? Section 133 says they have prophets among them. It says that when they come to Zion, they will be crowned with glory, which implies that they will have received all the ordinances up to that level. And if uh, the statement of Moroni to Joseph Smith is true, and I verily believe it is, it is that the ten tribes will come after the redemption of Zion, and after Zion is endowed with glory, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and they will come in. But they don't have the final keys, the full keys, to do those, to give those final endowments and those final blessings. See? And so when they come, they will come to be crowned with glory, like section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants says. Well, thank you very much. And we'll see you this evening. We want to talk about the second coming, and we'll barrel along at 50 miles an hour for two hours on that. Thanks. <laughs>